Pro Bono Happy Hour. I'm Rena Glazer. Welcome back. Today we're speaking to Foley Hoag's Rebecca Casabon. Rebecca spoke to us from her office in Boston. We discussed her role, the firm's pro bono program, the access to justice culture in Boston, advice for summer associates, and more. As a special treat, this episode features music from Rebecca's father, Salvador Casabon, and his group, Trio Los Trebales, and their rendition of Guantanamera by Jose Marti and Julian Orban. A longer excerpt plays at the end of the episode. Thanks so much to Rebecca and her dad for sharing this song with us. We hope you enjoy the conversation and the music. Rebecca, welcome and thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much, Rena. It's great to be here with you. We're really excited to speak with you. Let's jump right in. Tell us a little bit about your background, where you grew up, where you went to school. In other words, tell us about you. Sure. So uh, I was born in Spain, uh, in Madrid, uh, in uh, 1972. My um, father is Cuban and my mom uh, American. Uh, They met in Spain. My uh, father left Cuba um, in 1963 when he was uh, 16, uh, came to the United States and Uh, finished high school here in the United States, and then moved to Spain when his family uh, fled Cuba um, during the um, Castro regime at the beginning, and then joined his family in Madrid. And my parents met. Uh, I lived in Madrid uh, for a couple years, and we left uh, to move to the United States when uh, I was uh, about two years old. Um, so we moved to, uh, the Boston area. We lived in Cambridge and Watertown and, um, I went to Watertown high. And, uh, then from there I went to Wellesley college and, um, majored in political science and Spanish. Uh, while I was there, uh, I spent, uh, a semester in Madrid, which was great to be able to, um, go back after so many years. And um, after, uh, after Wellesley, I, um, I really wanted to be a teacher, uh, actually. And um, I did a lot of volunteer teaching when I was in high school and in college uh, and had applied for Teach for America, which was a fairly new program at the time. Uh, And unfortunately, did not um, get accepted into Teach for America, which was um, really disappointing. Uh, And I hadn't really thought about what else um, I was going to do. I never really thought that, um, you know, I never thought about going to law school at that point. Uh, My mom was a teacher, um, and um, we had a lot of teacher friends. Uh, And so, you know, I I kind of figured I would uh, follow in my mom's footsteps and be a teacher. Uh, And so while I was kind of figuring out what I would do, I um, decided to uh, take a look at the uh, Career Center message board. Back then, we had a bulletin board where uh, uh, businesses would post their their job openings and, and students could take a look and apply. And there was a position, um, open open position for paralegal in Boston. And uh, I figured, you know, I, I didn't really have any other um, great options uh, when I was a, a senior at Wellesley. So I applied and got the position. Uh, and so I worked as a paralegal for a year at a law firm in Boston, which is no longer in existence, McCormick and Epstein, and had a really great um experience there, um, working with uh, lawyers and doing research and um, editing documents and um, doing um, deposition um, uh, transcripts and uh, decided um, after being encouraged by a couple lawyers at the firm that I would um, apply to law school. And uh, then I went to uh, GW Law School in uh, D.C. And um, 
uh, really, really enjoyed that experience. Okay, so I want to ask you about some of what you just told us. So many uh, sure. bells and whistles running off. So when you, sure. do you have memories from being a little child in Spain? So when you went back, was that familiar or were you sort of too young to have the sort of pre two and under uh, <laughs> recollections? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting. Um, I when when I went back to Madrid to the place, um, you know, I was uh, the the apartment building that I was first brought home to as a baby. Uh, I definitely felt a, a sort of a strange uh, connection to to that place, and um, you know, I, I I know it wasn't because I remembered it, but there was definitely something. Uh, very familiar about it. And um, I, uh, you know, I, I just enjoyed my time in Madrid so much uh, and went to the, you know, the place that my parents met um, called Cueva de Sesamo, which um, is a is a bar in uh, in Madrid. And my father, um, who's who's a musician and he still plays guitar and sings, was singing at this bar um, and my mom happened to be there with a friend, and they met. I was able to go back to that very same spot where they met. So it was uh, it was very meaningful to, to be able to do that. That is so awesome. I always wonder when we have these very young, you know, sort of toddler-esque almost experiences, whether when we're back reliving them, whether we actually have sort of the sense memory of it, or we've seen mm. so many pictures and have heard so many stories yeah. about it that it's like implanted memory. I, I've always, right. I think it's probably a little bit of all, but it, it's always fascinating when we go back to formative experiences and re-experience them as, it's as true. older people. So, all right, as a graduate of a woman's college, tell mm -hmm. me about your Wellesley experience. I want to do super shout out to, to women's colleges. So. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, yeah, so I, I uh, loved it. It was uh, Wellesley was my uh, first choice. I applied early. Um, I was the first person at my high school, Watertown High School, to get into college, which was really exciting. And they, uh, you know, posted um, our names and our colleges as we would get in. And so mine was was first. Uh, I, um, I I got so much out of the experience. Um, made amazing friends and um, friends I, I still still have uh, close close friends um, you know uh, one thing that comes to mind I mean the academics just just amazing and the professors but something um, uh, which which was really important to me it was to be able to gain confidence in um, doing sports I had never uh, done sports, uh, you know, in, in really in elementary, junior high, or high school. Um, I never thought of myself as particularly athletic. Uh, I was more of a, you know, drama, music uh, type person and loved uh, musical theater and and dancing and, and singing and, and playing um, in the band, but never... Um, uh, never did any any sort of sport. So when I got to Wellesley, I was able to do tennis. Um, I um, became um, a runner, and I would run with with friends just for fun. Um, and you know, uh, just to giving me that opportunity to um, to to participate in in sports without feeling like I was um, you know needing to compete or that. I was being judged by others, especially boys and men, uh, who would think, you know, she has no right to, to, uh, to kind of, you know, try to be an athlete because obviously, you know, she's not fit enough or she's not, um, you know, um, able enough to, to do that. But, but yeah, I mean, Wellesley was uh, just a, a tremendous um, 
opportunity for me. And um, I would encourage anyone, any woman, to uh, consider a, an all-women's college. Yeah, co-signed. I'm glad that they're having a moment. <laughs> they really yeah. seem to be more popular yeah. than ever, uh, given yeah. what's going on these days yeah. and in the world. So let's talk a little bit about your time at GW Law School, just down the street from us. And we have, I will go a shout out, we have an amazing law student, Leah Calabro, who's one of our interns this summer. She and Scholar, she just finished her first year at GW and she's amazing. So you have a, yeah, yeah. Uh, a little, uh, someone following in your footsteps <laughs> yeah, in, the, uh, in the amazing uh, community of GW Law. So tell us a little bit about your experience here in Washington and at GW. Yeah. So um, I uh, I went to GW. Um, it was it was actually between GW and Northeastern, both great schools. And um, at the time, um, uh, I really wanted to uh, kind of move away from from my family and and have an opportunity to uh, live in another city. So uh, I went to GW. Um, it it was kind of a um, a shock initially because it is so big and um, very different from uh, my experience at Wellesley, where our classes were quite small and um, we had you know good relationships with with the professors and um, just more of a you know uh, we were, there was more of an exchange of ideas and um, it felt pretty, pretty safe um, in terms of, you know, um, uh, making arguments and, um, and whatnot. And so at, at GW, my, I think my section had, I don't know, like 120 uh, law students my first year. So uh, it was easy to feel um, pretty small and, uh, and it was um, um, quite uh, nerve-wracking to to uh, to have to speak in in a, in a room of you know so many so many students. Uh, I wasn't crazy about the Socratic method. I got used to it, uh, but initially, uh, uh, probably like a lot of law students, I I dreaded going to class. But it made me prepare um, really thoroughly. So, so there was that. Um, so, probably the highlight of my um, my three years at uh, GW was the uh, immigration clinic. So, I participated my third year in uh, the immigration clinic. I took um, the immigration course that goes with the clinic. And uh, I worked at the clinic for a certain amount of hours every week. And um, I, I understand that the uh, professor who ran the clinic uh, is still there, Alberto Benitez, who uh, was an amazing mentor and uh, teacher and gave me a lot of um, uh, you know, a lot of the confidence that I needed to um, represent my very first client. Uh, so it was a family from Eritrea, and um, they they had been granted asylum and were uh, applying for their legal permanent residency. And so with Professor Benitez, uh, I was able to... Um, obtain their um, green cards. Uh, and so that was an incredible um, experience and being able to, you know, uh, meet with the family to prepare and, um, and, you know, help them throughout the process was, um, was just so, so meaningful and um, sort of convinced me that I, um, I wanted to, to, to help individuals in, in, in that way. We'll come back uh, a little bit to your light bulb moments, but I'm curious yeah. sort of what your spin is. We, we've talked to a number of people on the show who work in uh, the immigration space, whether as sort of um, pro bono cases or as full-time legal services, lawyers running immigration 
programs mm -hmm. and they come to it from an immigrant perspective because they or their families immigrated mm. to the United States or they had a parent who mm -hmm. was an immigrant. Do you think the family history that you shared with us kind yeah. of played any role in your affinity for oh. the immigration work? Yeah, absolutely. Even though um, I may not have realized it then uh, because it was somewhat, you know, growing up the way I did was just normal for me and was my reality. But, you know, having moved to this country, um, you know, when, when I was just a baby and um, having to kind of restart. So my parents, when they came, had very little money. We struggled financially. Um, we needed to rely on public assistance for a period of time. Uh, I never thought that I was um, lacking or um, somehow, you know, um, not uh, getting as much as, as my friends were in terms of presence and, and, you know, new sneakers and whatnot. But um, I know now that it was, it was really hard for my, for my family. And even given all of that, those difficulties, we still always, no matter where we were living, if we were living with my grandparents for a while, we were living, you know, in a, in a, terrible roach infested apartment in uh, um, Central Square for, for a couple of years, um, we'd always open our, our, our home to, to others. And so we'd have people living with us who at the time, you know, I thought they were some more family, many were just friends who um, were also immigrants and coming to this country for the first time and needing, needing a place to, to stay you know, a place to have dinner, um, a place to, to share community. And so that was very much part of my upbringing and my, my reality. So um, it seemed like very natural for me to, to want to help um, immigrants. And, uh, um, you know, and, and I continue to, to focus on that work now. So you've shared just now, and, and since we started talking, a number of incidents of personal resilience and strength. And I'm mm -hmm. sure that that sparked a certain uh, aspect of your passion for pro bono and access to justice. And we've talked about um, assisting immigrants. What other nature, nurture uh, do you think went into um, galvanizing this passion of yours? You know, I, I think the fact that um, I saw from from an early age just how how hard it was for um, for immigrants for for low income people to um, to get through the system and to uh, understand you know how to access um, the, the the services that 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 they need. Um, I, my, um, so just going back to, to family, since that's kind of where I'm maybe f feeling right now, my, um, my maternal grandmother was a social worker and, um, she would, uh, always have, um, people, people over her house who had, uh, um, you know, a, a whole host of, uh, challenges um, she had several friends who were blind and, and would be, would be over. And, um, she, uh, was very open to, um, people from, from all different, um, backgrounds. Uh, I mean, I guess in terms of, you know, how this translated into, um, actual, uh, an actual career, um, it, it was, I think figuring out, you know, that I wanted to, to do um, direct legal representation and help individual um, uh, clients that, you know, I knew that from an early start, but then to, to translate that into a job, you know, was a lot more challenging. So maybe it would be useful to, to talk a little bit about what happened um, sort of after uh, after law school or the third year, my third year of law school. So I had um, decided I was going to, to uh, do the Army JAG Corps. And so the, the JAG is the Judge Advocates 
general core, and uh, I had done it as a um, uh, as a uh, second year um, law student in the summer. So when um, a lot of students were doing their clerkships at law firms, I um, I did the Army JAG, and I worked in Heidelberg, and that was an amazing experience, uh, and I really you know, um, enjoyed, um, being, uh, you know, doing, doing the, the legal work that I did. Uh, then I decided I was going to, um, actually apply for the JAG, which I did. And while I, uh, I had to wait until I passed the, the bar before, uh, starting the class, the JAG class, which was, I guess, in April, uh, following, um, you know, the, the next year after I graduated. And while I was waiting for the bar results, I realized that I needed to, uh, to, to make some money to be able to start paying off my law school loans and, um, and, uh, you know, to help, uh, help live. So I, um, went to, uh, I decided to, uh, work at a law firm. And so, uh, I worked, I went through a temp agency and I ended up here at, at Foley Hoag where I, um, you know, where I started as a, essentially, um, you know, as a legal assistant and, um, in working with, uh, the, the lawyers here, I realized that, um, it was a you know really great place to work. I never considered working at a law firm, and um, you know luckily they were at a point where they needed a um, a lawyer to run their pro bono program. It had been run by um, you know a, a partner who had a full uh, caseload and then a billable caseload, and then in addition to that was um, you know managing the pro bono program. So in some ways, uh, you know, I was here at the right time, and uh, we negotiated this position. That was a long time ago. That was, um, you know, back in 1999-2000 when um, a position of, you know, pro bono counsel or pro bono coordinator or manager or whatever uh, wasn't uh, that common. And, uh, you know, I, I think... Foley Hoag was one of the first firms to um, create such a position. Well, it, it's uh, an, yeah, it's an yeah. exciting anniversary. So that's you know very exciting, very formative. And um, before we uh, drill down on the firm and and your role, yeah. I did want to just mention, <laughs> you know, a number of decades ago, people weren't as familiar with JAG, but then there was the TV show JAG, and then that morphed into NCIS, and now everyone knows what JAG is. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I feel like it is really embedded in, in popular culture, but now that we've gotten you at Foley Hoag and we've gotten yeah. you in your job, tell yeah. us, you know, before we kind of deep dive into your day and, and your yeah. role, tell us a yeah. little bit about the firm for people who aren't familiar, sort of where you are, what you do, yeah. How, how, what's your kind of elevator speech about Foley Hoag? <laughs> okay, so um, Foley Hoag uh, has uh, four offices. We're based in uh, Boston. Our, our, our other offices are in uh, Washington, D.C., New York, and Paris, France. Uh, I've never been to the Paris office, uh, although I hope to uh, be able to go uh, sometime in the near future. Uh, we have about 275 lawyers. Um, we have uh, a pro bono committee, and our pro bono committee is made up of uh, three partners um, and me. Uh, the I think the firm culture is um, really supportive of pro bono. Uh, we have a long history of doing pro bono and community service, and uh, I get a lot of support from our top management. Um, not sure what else. Oh, I know. We're very important. We are um, a signatory to the uh, PBI Law Firm Pro Bono Challenge, which uh, we have signed on to 
I think since the very beginning, if we're not one of the, uh, you know, the, the first, we are, you know, the second or something. Well, thank you. Thank you for that commercial for the challenge. That was unplanned. <laughs> and we will send you some swag as an extra thank you. So, <laughs> thank you for that. This part of the podcast brought to you by the Law Firm Pro Bono Challenge. <laughs> um, <laughs> so as we mentioned, you, you've been leading the firm's pro bono program for mm, a while now. Tell <laughs> us, what do you enjoy? What are some of the aspects that you enjoy most about this work? Okay, so um, there are so many, and uh, I, I realize I'm very fortunate that, that I can um, say that. So, you know, I think, so I'll, I'll, I'll name a few. So first and foremost, uh, it's, being able to help so many people over the years um, through our program, um, you know, I realize that uh, I, if if it were just me doing this work, uh, whether it be you know in a in a as a public interest lawyer or at a legal services organization, um, you know, I wouldn't be able to reach uh, so many just as just one you know uh, public interest attorney, but in uh, because I'm overseeing a whole program and and um, oftentimes uh, supervising uh, you, know, you know ten to fifteen attorneys um, in in a given month, let's say uh, I'm able to um, help you know just just an incredible uh, number of of people and and in many different ways we are um our firm, you know, has uh, many different areas of, of expertise. Um, we have an immigration practice here, and um, it, you know, beyond the billable practice, we have 10 to 15 um, attorneys that do immigration pro bono work. So they have developed an expertise. Uh, we have a really um, uh, robust uh, domestic violence and sexual assault prevention uh, program and uh, you know at any given time we probably have uh, 40 lawyers and paralegals and others who are um, working on domestic violence and sexual assault cases and so uh, you know just being able to to, to help so many in, in, in different areas uh, and then I guess the next the other um, sort of thing that I really enjoy is, is being able to teach and mentor. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier on, um, I, I always thought I was going to be a teacher and, um, you know, was quite, I think, uh, disappointed when that didn't uh, pan out for me. And so, um, you know, now I'm, I'm able to, to, uh, to teach and mentor and, being able to um, kind of pass on the knowledge that I've gained over the past 20 years or so um, is, uh, is, is a real joy, and uh, I'm really lucky to be able to, to do that. Uh, and, you know, every, every summer we have our summer associates start. We, they started today. Um, and then in the fall we have our new group of uh, associates, and that's – like the best, one of the best, the two best days of the year because I get this whole new group of young, um, very enthusiastic uh, attorneys or soon to be attorneys who want to do good work and um, want to feel passionate about something. And so being able to give them um, that outlet and a way to, um, uh, to kind of you know, do something that they're really excited about and uh, a way to help people is, um, I think, uh, pretty exciting. I really like the image of seeing a supervisory role as being a teacher. <laughs> I mm. think I think that mm. is a, a great way for um, lawyers and legal staff who are bringing along and nurturing uh maybe people who are less experienced in a certain pro bono mm -hmm. space, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's really mm -hmm. to cultivate and train and nurture and be supportive. And then 
um, the success, you know, however we define success mm. in that moment can sometimes be much more gratifying than if we had handled the whole matter soup to nuts ourselves, sort of seeing right, someone right. else then kind of grow and then they master it. And then in the future, they're supervising someone and the whole sort of evolution and, and, and right. transfer of pro bono skills and knowledge is that's a great sort of positive uh, mm. framing of the role and the job and the value mm -hmm. and, and the satisfaction. So since you mentioned um, that it's summer, it's summer associate uh -huh. season, yay. Um, do you have any particular advice for law students and lawyers who are just starting their careers? Of course I do. <laughs> do pro bono. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I luckily, um, the the summer associates and the the new associates who who, who first um, start here, um, most of them are very enthusiastic about doing pro bono, and you know um, we meet with them early and tell them all the opportunities, uh, and so I think I think they get it. Uh, they've also uh, just had many of them really great pro bono experiences at their law schools. And they've done, you know, clinical programs and they've traveled to other states and, and out of the country to do um, pro bono and community service. So most of them really see the value and want to want to keep it up and want to continue to do it. Uh, now, I guess, um, you know, they're doing uh, they're doing it for the, for the right reasons. Uh, and uh, initially, and that's great, which is to to be able to help to help folks, and um, because they they uh, want to feel like they're you know part of a, 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 a community and, and something bigger than themselves, which is great. But I guess the the other piece I would say, not just to new um, uh, lawyers, but to um, experienced ones too, is that there are other benefits uh, that uh, folks don't always think about. And I think it's okay and important to talk about. So the professional development um, benefit, uh, the, the, the skills that you uh, can gain in a, in a pro bono case. Um, you know, a lot of our uh, folks who, who have done pro bono over the years and will, will talk about um, some of the things that, that are most valuable about it, uh, the, the litigators almost always say that it was uh, in a pro bono case that they were able to make their first um, oral argument uh, before um, an appellate court. You know, in a pro bono case that they filed their first brief, a pro bono case that they um, uh, did a direct and cross in, 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 in front of a judge in court. Uh, and then, you know, for corporate corporate attorneys, it's often uh, their opportunity to to have their own client and to be able to um, be the person, the go-to person for a nonprofit uh, who's who's having um, you know challenges with uh, any any number of uh, corporate issues. So uh, I think you know stressing the the amount of um, exposure and the amount of learning that you're going to to um, to get, and uh, it's um, it, you know it's I think it's just really really important to to uh, to to keep that in mind as well. Yeah, there are a lot of motivators and drivers to do pro mm. bono work, and and they're all good. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so we we have an extra special connection here at PBI to Boston, even though you know as we mentioned we're sitting here in Washington D.C. Our founder, Esther Larden, also founded the Volunteer Lawyers Project of the Boston Bar. It was one of the first programs of its kind in the United States, and she ran it from about 1977 to, to 1985. So I think we've always had this sort of stickiness with, with Boston. And I was hoping you could talk a little bit about the pro bono and access to justice culture like in, in the area, in, in mm -hmm. kind of Boston as a community. Yeah, sure. So um, I work uh, very closely with the Volunteer Lawyers Project uh, and have um, 
we've partnered with them on on a number a number of projects, and we think that they are terrific. Uh, uh, getting back to kind of generally the, um, the the access to justice culture here uh, in Boston, uh, it's a, a wonderful legal community. Um, the I think it's it's very collaborative. Uh, it feels uh, pretty small in a lot of ways, uh, which which is um, which is is nice. Um, we we all kind of know each other. Um, I've worked with the Boston Bar Association um, over the you know last I don't know 10 15 years on a number of different initiatives. I'm currently the co-chair of the delivery of legal services section of the Boston Bar Association. So um, I've been able to work with um, a really wonderful group of legal services. Um, attorneys and public interest law f and law firm attorneys uh, and attorneys from the um, district attorney's office. And uh, that has been, uh, you know, really a, a wonderful way to, to learn about what people are doing. And um, we've put on tr trainings and uh, various programs uh, through the through the, the Boston Bar Association. We also have the Massachusetts Access to Justice Commission, which uh, is very active, and I've got a lot of um, a lot of uh, friends who who participate in that commission, and uh, they are uh, doing a, a lot of amazing work. Um, the our um, Supreme Judicial Court. Uh, Standing Committee on Pro Bono Legal Services is uh, another uh, organization that, um, or group that uh, promotes pro bono at law firms and um, in-house, um, you know, in-house um, attorneys encourages in-house attorneys to do pro bono, and they uh, are very, very um, hardworking and committed, and they give a. Uh, and award, several awards um, every year to uh, lawyers and law students who've um, shown a you know outstanding commitment to to doing pro bono. Uh, and then the we've got this, the legal services organizations. Uh, the Mass uh, Bar Association has a number of pro bono initiatives. Women's Bar Foundation. Which um, we work closely with. They do. Uh, they have a family law project for um, battered women, and an elder law project, uh, and uh, they have a project um, working with incarcerated women. Uh, the um, the there's a organization. Uh, well, there's ABCO, which is the Association for um, Pro Bono Counsel. And uh, we have several law firms in Boston who um, that, that where the pro bono counsel or managers are members of APCO uh, and other firms that aren't. Uh, but we meet on a regular basis uh, to to talk about best practices, talk about um, you know uh, legal services organizations projects, and uh, that is extremely helpful. They are my really my community, and um, beyond our meetings, I'm uh, on the phone with someone, <laughs> um, you know, one of my pro bono uh, council colleagues, um, you know, on a regular basis. So uh, I think all in all, it's uh, things work uh, quite well in Boston. Yeah, it's a wonderful community. I think we talk a lot about, particularly on the law firm side, law firms being competitors in the marketplace, but collaborators in pro bono. And I think that's yeah. definitely true in Boston, where, you know, for, for decades now, the leaders have had regular meetings and communication, and we're able to kind of brainstorm and support each other and you know, address emerging issues and pivot mm -hmm. and respond. And mm -hmm. it's it's really a collegial community and, and a wonderful model for, for other communities in the country. So many good things come out of there and uh, get replicated mm -hmm. and modeled. And it's it's just, it's great to be a pioneer. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so 
Um, loyal listeners will know that we have a regular segment on the show called Tell Us About Your First Time. So, mm-hmm. Rebecca, tell us yeah. about an early or first pro bono matter that you handled. Okay, so uh, this, uh, I, I represented a, um, a woman who at the time was in her early 20s uh, who came to me through Greater Boston Legal Services, their um, battered women's project. Uh, she uh, was in an abusive relationship, uh, had a, a young daughter, and was um, out of status, didn't, didn't have immigration status. Her uh, then abuser, who she was not married to, uh, had his green card. So um, the, the plan was for me to, first of all, help her um, gain immigration status by uh, doing a self-petition under uh, VAWA, the Violence Against Women Act, and um, essentially ask that she can uh, apply for um, legal status without needing to go through her abusive partner. Um, However, she was still in an abusive relationship, and um, I realized, having done some domestic violence work before taking on this case, that it was essential for her to have an order of protection um, to to be able to safely, you know, um, kind of complete the the immigration case. So I met with her, um, uh, you know, over I don't know six months, uh, many many times, and eventually she. Um, agreed that it was best for her to to get a restraining order. It was at the right time. He had left um, the household, and it was a good time to to do it. So I helped her with the restraining order and also um, obtain a restraining order uh, order of protection. And also we applied for her her, uh, self-petition so she could uh, have uh, eventually get, get a green card. So uh, I got to know this client quite well, and um, eventually, after uh, a long wait, she became a legal permanent resident, and just um, maybe two or three years ago, she became a U.S. citizen, and I went, she invited me to go to the, um, the, the, the ceremony, and I was able to be there with her, which was incredibly meaningful. Um, So my client now um, was able to to go to college, and um, she worked as, as she still does, as a home health aide, and uh, has been working at a domestic violence uh, shelter to um, to to uh, help other other women who've been abused. And, um, you know, I consider her a friend now that she's no longer a client. And uh, she is um, just an incredible, incredible woman who's, um, who's taught me a lot. And uh, it, uh, it was, uh, you know, an amazing, um, amazing early experience for me. That is amazing and incredibly inspiring. Thank you for sharing that. Let's wind down with this. We have okay. looked, um, we've taken a great stroll down memory lane, right? Your, yeah. your, your journey to the firm, your work at the firm, um, inspiring uh, activities in, in Boston and in, in the pro bono and access to justice community. So let's end with this. Let's look forward. What is on the horizon for the firm's pro bono program? Tell us about something new in the works or a goal that you have or some vision forward that you could share. Okay. Uh, so one goal that I've, I've, I've had for quite some time, but I haven't been able to, um, to, to reach this goal, is to get every attorney um, at the firm in all our offices to do at least 20 hours of pro bono a year. Uh, I know um, this has been a challenge for us and for other 
for other firms, but uh, it's something that um, I have been, you know, working working hard to to try to get folks, um, uh, you know, opportunities to to provide uh, as many options to to people as I can, so that they can, in fact, um, you know, do do that amount of pro bono. Um, so that's that's sort of one one goal. Uh, one another kind of interesting initiative that I've been asked to uh, participate in is a um, as part of their the firm's wellness initiative. I know um, you've probably heard that a lot of firms are uh, signing on to the ABA. I think it's like the a wellness challenge um, to um, you know kind of support their their attorneys. Uh, and 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 help them um, access mental health uh, services and um, uh, alcohol abuse, um, you know, uh, uh, help and 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 whatnot. So as kind of part of this this initiative to to help lawyers um, take better care of themselves and recognize that. You know, it's 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 not all about working. Uh, you have to kind of help help yourself and and um, think about how you can um, live a more fulfilling and um, happy life. Um, I've been asked to do a program on pro bono and well-being, so I'm going to be doing that this summer for summer associates and others. Uh, I um, have been kind of thinking about how pro bono um, can um, help uh, lawyers feel more engaged in in their in their work in their legal community uh, and how they can find you know um, meaningful work through pro bono um, so yeah, so it's so it's something I've I've uh, I've been thinking about and um, reading reading up on uh, to see what what else um, is out there. But it's an area that uh, I think is um, you know it's it's uh, it's interesting and I think um, kind of an important angle on the on the um, emphasis on improving well being of um, attorneys. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's both cutting edge and a little overdue. So I think those are, yeah, yeah those are awesome uh, goals and projects. And uh, thank you so much for sharing them. And thank you so much for talking with me today. It's been such a pleasure. Oh, you're welcome, Rena. It's been really fun. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much to Rebecca for being our guest today. We're so grateful that she took the time to be with us and for all the important work that she's doing. Hey, listeners, we'd love to hear from you. Send your comments, feedback, and suggestions to our new email address, lawfirm at probonoinst.org. New and archived episodes of the podcast can be found on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and now, thanks to producer John, Spotify and Stitcher. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already and take a minute to leave a review. It's quick and easy to do. We'd appreciate the feedback and it would help make it easier for other listeners to find the show and expand our conversation about pro bono and access to justice. And we might just send you some swag in return. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time on the Pro Bono Happy Hour. Yeah.